Hello, everyone. Welcome to panel nine, Products, Appliances, ICT. My name is Eva Geilinger, and I'm co-leading this panel together with Thomas Goetz this year. This session is called um, Products, Technologies and Policy Implications One. And we have three speakers from three continents, from Europe, India, and Australia. You can see them, I think, already on the screen. Um, so that's pretty good for teleworking, I would say. And let's start with the first presentation by Jonas Müller. Jonas is an energy and modeling specialist at Tap Energy in Zurich, Switzerland. His work focuses on renewable energies, energy systems, as well as statistics and modeling. Before joining TEP Energy, he worked as a research assistant at the University of Geneva in the Renewable Energy Systems Group. Jonas studied environmental engineering and sciences at ETH Zurich. And just before we hear the presentation, Please, to all of you listening live, um, it would help us if you post your questions right away already during the presentation, uh, because we only have five minutes or less in the end. So like this, we can answer as many questions as possible. So we're ready to hear the presentation. Yeah, welcome also from my side. My name is Jonas Miller. I work at TEP Energy based in Zurich. Uh, at TEP Energy, we do research and advice on energy and building relevant topics. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce you to the presentation of our study about power consumption and energy efficiency potentials in data centers, a case study from Switzerland. This study was conducted together with the University of Applied Sciences in Lucerne, and the whole project was funded by Swiss Energy. Yeah, so the main motivation for this study was the significant energy demand in data centers and server rooms. A European study showed that already in 2018, 2.7% of the, the total power consumption was due to server rooms and data centers. Similarly, a study from Switzerland showed that data centers and server rooms were already responsible for about 2.8% of the total power consumption in 2013. Besides uh, the power consumption, significant efficiency potentials have been observed in the past. And finally, based on the current trends, further power demand increase is expected also for the future. This leads us to the goals of this study, which are first to identify the power consumption of the Swiss data center in 2019, this based on three different segments. The second goal was to estimate the remaining energy efficiency potential. And third, to analyze the past developments since the last study in 2013, and to also look a little bit into the future and the, the developments in the Swiss data center market. Yeah, so the whole uh, study was based on an online survey of a stratified sample in Switzerland. This online survey was conducted in spring and summer uh, 2020. And for that, <clears throat> three different segments were defined. Uh, segment A includes the DC service provider for which uh, 57 DC service provider were contacted. Um, segment B includes the in-house data centers um, for which uh, a bit more than 2,000 companies uh, were compact contacted. And the segment C includes smaller server rooms 
in small and medium sized companies and for this uh, a bit more than 500 uh, companies um, or organizations were contacted. Depending on the segment, the response rate laid somewhere between 22 and 39%. For all three different segments, um, a questionnaire was defined and all of them uh, included uh, question, uh, questions about the power consumption, the installed IT capacity, then the power usage effectiveness, uh, one of the key indicators for energy uh, efficiency. Then, uh, of course, uh, questions about the DC infrastructure, such as the cooling method, the cooling water temperature, uh, the system temperature, and so on. And questions about the IT infrastructure, such as the number of server, uh, the utilization of the server's network and storage, and um, then the different storage types and the backup systems used in a data center. Yeah, so let's have a look at some of the descriptive results uh, from the online survey. Um, here we see on the left-hand side, the distribution of the power usage effectiveness. So the PUE, um, which is uh, the key indicator for energy efficiency in a data center. And it is defined as the total energy used in a data center, including energy for the infrastructure, such as cooling or ventilation, divided by the energy only used for the IT systems. And what we can see is that um, there are quite some differences between these two segments A and B. So uh, data centers uh, from DC service provider um, have uh, significantly lower PUE values. So um, in the lowest categories with a PUE uh, smaller than 1.2, we have much more data centers from segment A. And this basically shows that the closer the PUE gets to one, the less energy is needed for the infrastructure part and the more efficient the data center is. On the right hand side, we see the distribution of the system temperature. And again, we see some differences between these two segments. Um, the highest uh, temperatures uh, above 26 degrees Celsius are more frequent, frequent uh, for DC service providers. And uh, these high temperatures are desired and important to increase the days at which uh, free cooling can be used. Here we have the, <clears throat> the results of another question um, regarding uh, already implemented energy efficiency measures, such as, uh, for example, the enclosure of server racks, but also the use, uh, usage of free cooling or high system temperatures. And what you can see is that um, in-house data centers um, showed in green and especially uh, data centers from DC service providers um, have uh, are significantly more frequent to have already implemented uh, a high number of these measures. On the right hand side, we also made a comparison with the indicated PUE in the survey. So basically um, those data centers with, which have indicated a PUE, which are aware of their PUE, are also those um, which have uh, uh, a higher number of already implemented measures. Yeah, so the whole estimation of the power consumption um, also uh, was also based on the results from the online survey. So for those participants uh, which didn't indicate the power consumption directly in the survey or it couldn't be directly estimated, we used uh, regression models. And for that we used uh, explaining variables such as the number of servers, uh, the DC space, 
uh, the number of employees or the segment. And uh, for the final step, um, we made an extrapolation and for that we defined coverage factors. And <clears throat> to uh, cope with this uncertainty of these coverage factors, we defined three different scenarios. Our best guess scenario, scenario two, um, accounts uh, for uh, or estimates the power consumption to a bit more than two terawatt hours for all data centers and server rooms in Switzerland. And uh, this corresponds to about 3.6% of the Swiss total power consumption in the year 2019. <clears throat> uh, when we look at the figure, we can see that besides um, the consumption in uh, data centers from service providers, there is a substantial consumption in in-house uh, data centers. Yeah, similar uh, to the power consumption, the estimation of the efficiency potential is also based on the online survey. So it is based on the results about the questions um, on the infrastructure part, but also on the IT part. And uh, we again defined, defined uh, different scenarios. This time uh, it was important because um, for those uh, participants which didn't answer all of the questions, we had to impute data and to show a little bit the uncertainty, um, these scenarios can for that be used. Um, for that, we define the uh, scenarios between worst case and best case, where worst, worst case uh, basically means that if a participant didn't answer a question, we just imputed the worst possible answer. And for the best case, we imputed the best possible answer in the survey. Yeah, so for, for both uh, part, the infrastructural part and the IT part, we calculated the uh, energy efficiency potential. And overall, we have a total efficiency potential of about 46% um, for the year 2019. Yeah, so we have seen that um, the power consumption in Switzerland uh, due to power, uh, uh, data centers and server rooms moderately increased since 2013, since the last study. And in the same period, the total power consumption in Switzerland uh, even slightly decreased. So Switzerland is still above the average also com in comparison with uh, Europe, the other European countries. There are of course uh, countries such as the Netherlands and also regions uh, such as the Northern countries uh, which have a very high um, uh, data center uh, density, but uh, overall Switzerland is still above average compared to uh, the other European countries. Uh, we think, and also after discussion with some experts, that the demand for computing power and data storage will not only increase in the future, but it will probably even increase stronger. And this has several reasons. Um, first, uh, that there are new trends such as Internet of Things, big data and cloud computing, which uh, require a huge amount of computing power. The second main reason is that a large public cloud providers haven't been active in Switzerland before uh, 2019. So companies such as Microsoft, uh, Oracle, and Amazon are just entering the Swiss PC market. Amazon, for example, um, announced to open their first uh, data centers by 2022. And uh, the Microsoft and Oracle started uh, with their own data centers um, at the end of the year 2019. Finally, um, another Swiss study also showed that there are many projects planned and even under construction, uh, especially in these two regions around Zurich and 
the Lake Geneva. Yeah, so based on these insights, um, we think it's very important to further foster um, the topic of energy efficiency and uh, the results from these studies from this study uh, might help uh, first uh, to inform and also train planners and investors and operators uh, of data centers. Um, <clears throat> the results might also help the Pueda Plus uh, promotion program, which is a promotion program conducted by Tap Energy and Ginwell. And it basically uh, helps uh, data centers and server rooms of medium size in Switzerland to implement um, some of the efficiency measures we have seen before in the presentation. Finally, um, the results might also help uh, organizations such, such as the Swiss Data Center Efficiency Association, which uh, recently launched um, their own efficiency label. So data centers basically can apply for an efficiency label between bronze, silver, and gold, depending on their current state of energy efficiency. We think that future work should uh, focus on the consideration of further IT measures, um, which haven't been the focus of this study, such as, for example, the quality of power supply, but also intelligent switches. And finally, we also think it's very important to, to study the customers of DC service providers, because we have seen that many DC service provider um, already by now serve a lot of customers abroad. And uh, of course, this has a big influence on the power consumption. Yeah, so this leads me to the end of uh, this presentation. And uh, I thank you very much for your interest. Okay, thank you very much. Um, can you tell us, Jonas, about the general data availability um, for data centers in Switzerland? Uh, yes, so um, uh, what we, um, so what we basically used for the survey was a, a database um, from uh, an ICT service provider called Profundia AG. Um, they have a, a huge database with all important um, IT service providers, including data centers. Um, what they do basically is um, they also, they contact them. They have also um, attributes about their company. So the number of servers they use, um, sometimes the DC space, uh, the, the segment um, of these companies. And that was basically the, the database we used then for the survey. And uh, within the survey, we, we then asked for, for this, uh, yeah, for this uh, key, key indicators like the PUE, the power consumption and uh, yeah, other variables. And uh, Regarding the quality, um, I mean, or what we what we have seen in the survey is that the, the companies are quite willing to to answer the questions. So uh, the response rates were, were quite high, higher than we expected, and uh, I think it's also um, <clears throat> nice for for many companies because uh, with this increasingly uh, yeah, more, in, uh, more important topic of energy efficiency in data center and especially also because one could read a lot about it in the newspaper. It's, it's important for, for these, especially large DC service providers to, to show um, which efficiency measures they have implemented, what their power, to measure the power consumption and to then also be able uh, to give numbers about these efficiency key indicators. Okay, great. Now I look at the time and I see that we already have to move on to the next presentation, but we might have a chance maybe at the very end of the session, if there are more questions, we can come back to all the speakers 
and maybe discuss some more. Um, but to keep the timing, let's move on to the second presentation by Tarun Garg. Um, thank you so much, Jonas. Uh, Tarun is a program leader at the Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy, AEEE, in Delhi, India. He has work experience of more than 13 years in leading and managing a portfolio of projects in India, Asia and Africa, in the building sector, as well as with cold chains, standards and labeling of appliances and more. And he has done his master's in energy and environment management from IIT Delhi and has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. So please start the presentation. A very good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me. My name is Tarun Garg, and I'm very happy and excited to take you through our analysis of potato value chain in West Bengal uh, with an objective to develop a roadmap for retrofitting from modernizing existing cold storages. I would like to thank my co-authors, Sandeep Kachawa, Kriti Purana, and Jerry George. I would like to express my gratitude to ECEEE for accepting the paper and giving us this opportunity. I'll take around 15 minutes to cover the presentation. And before I move, I would also like to thank Energy Efficiency Services Limited for providing their uh, continuous support during the study. Uh, moving on, uh, in this presentation, I'll cover overview of India, scenario on of cold chain, West Bengal scenario of cold chain, uh, field assessment done by us, energy performance analysis of three cold storages uh, as part of the overall study, investment strategies identified for energy efficiency interventions, as well as uh, the entire summary of the paper. Uh, moving on, it is uh, before we start, it is important to understand the definition of cold chain. Cold chain is an environmental controlled logistics chain, ensuring uninterrupted care from source to user consisting only of storage and distribution related activities in which the inventory is maintained within predetermined ambient parameters. Produce once harvested at the farm goes to the pack house for sorting, grading and pre-cooling and then via reefer vehicle that is refrigerated transport. It goes to cold storages and depending upon the market requirement, it goes to supermarkets, farmer market and then to consumers. Agriculture is one of the most important sectors of the Indian economy. And uh, the overview mentions here will again reiterate, uh, reiterate what I'm saying. It accounts for approximately 18.3% of country's gross domestic product GDP for the year 2020-21. Around 55% of India's total work for, for work, workforce still depends on agriculture for their livelihood. India is the second largest producer of fruits and third largest producer of vegetables in the world. And majority of land holdings are either small farmers or marginal farmers that is that that the, the number is as high as 86 percent and as per the institute of uh, indian council for agriculture agriculture research around 4.5 percent to 15.8 percent losses exist in fruits and vegetables and the wastage is as high as up to 30 percent in fruits and vegetables and because of the lack of adequate cold storage facilities uh, transport handling and processing uh, Moving on, the slide presents the infrastructure overview, and it can be seen that except cold storages, more than 80% of the infrastructure gap exists in pack houses, reefer vehicles, and lightning chambers. The gap presents an opportunity to frame policies and regulations to develop energy efficient and climate friendly cold chain infrastructure. Uh, before we get into the energy detail, energy analysis details, it would be important to first understand the agriculture and cold storage landscape in West Bengal. And some of the key points worth highlighting includes, so West Bengal, around 96% of uh, land holding belongs to small and medium scale farmers. Annual average income of West Bengal house, uh, agriculture household is around uh, 140 euros, which is one third of annual income of an agriculture household in India. That is around uh, 435 euros. It is the second most horticulture producing state in India in 2017-18 with potato as the major produce. West Bengal contributed to 27% of India's total potato production in 2018 and 19, and around 90% of 500 cold storages in the state are used for potato, and 32% of cold storages are more than 30 years old. 
So I think these are some of the important numbers uh, which will be reflected upon in this as part of this study and will be used uh, uh, as part of the study as well. Uh, moving on, cold storages are an essential link in potato supply chain. The infographic shows the farm to fork journey for potatoes in West Bengal. Potatoes from farmers goes to village traders and depending upon the market requirement, it either goes to the wholesale market or in the cold storage. From wholesale market, it goes to the retail vendors and also gets exported to other states. From retail vendors, it goes to the consumers. Now, during the unloading and loading process uh, of in cold storage, improper handling and baggage system increases potato losses at the wholesale and the retail level. Overall, 27 to 30 percent of losses are reported in the supply chain of potatoes in the West Bengal. <clears throat> Around 5 percent of losses occur at the farm level. 10% of losses occur during the storage process and around 12 to 15% of losses uh, occur at the wholesale and the retail level. Uh, several storage inefficiencies, poor handling process are the operational causes of waste in the supply chain. And these have been observed as part of this study as well. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, the basic details of three cold storages in the Hooghly district of West Bengal, where the energy assessments were conducted are presented in this table. Cold storage uh, owners, operators, cold storage industry association, government uh, officials in the agriculture marketing, food processing and horticulture departments, academia, national and global cold chain industry experts were consulted as part of this study. And some of the important points which would be important to highlight are age of these cold storages varies from 10 years to 34 years uh, capacity. Uh, varies from 9,500 metric tons to 16,000 metric tons. A refrigeration plant is a reciprocating ammonia compressor with gravity flooded system. Manual controls have been used and grid power is supplemented with the diesel generators, although 90% of the power is coming from the grid with 10% coming from the diesel generators. Moving on, uh, the slide presents field observation based on the data collected and stakeholders uh, stakeholders consultation. The thermal performance of walling and roofing material is inadequate and top of that air leakages are happening due to cracks in wall and roof. The leakages lead to condensation problems inside the cold storages. There are no provisions for strip curtains or air curtains with the doors whose insulating properties are also inadequate. Thermocol that is expanded polystyrene is the most common insulation material used for walls and for roof either fiberglass or expanded polystyrene has been used uh, for the insulation. Uh, this inefficient practice carried out to minimize the possible potato spoilage due to compression of bottom bottom backs as well as inadequate air circulation ends up damaging the potatoes due to physical shocks by improper manual handling of backs as well as adds up additional heat load due to working staff and lighting operation. Uh, mold, modern cold storage which can maintain the desired temperature, relative humidity, and air circulation levels obviates the need of flipping of bags, thus minimizing the handling and associated damages. Ammonia based gravity flooded system is the most common refrigeration plant you observed in West Bengal. And one of the reasons of, of this selection is uh, low cost, low maintenance, and availability of the technicians to maintain the plant. A refrigeration plant is typically run for only four to six hours per day, leading to suffocation of stored produce and deterioration of the of its quality. The overall refrigeration plant is is designed based on the non standard engineering practices and the reason is non availability of any standard which can be uh, non availability of the standard as well as unawareness amongst the consultants. Uh, automatic temperature based ammonia flow regulation and isolation walls are not present which again highlights the operation is manual and uh, in almost all the facilities ammonia safety control walls are absent. Moving on, the table shows the three facilities, annual energy consumption and expenditure for 2018 and 19 and 2019 and 20. The average unit price of electricity purchased from the grid varies from uh, uh, varies from seven rupees in, in, in Indian currency to eight rupees uh, kilo per kilowatt hour, uh, which which is quite low, which is almost half uh, half of the rate uh, of the electricity if we take it from the uh, diesel generators. Fortunately, 90% of the power is coming from the grid uh, and with only 10% coming from the diesel generators, which shows the availability of the grid uh, at the location of the cold storages. 
and also uh, we have uh, we have also observed the energy intensity uh, of these cold storages and for one of the years that is 2019 and 20 the energy intensity varies from 41 kilowatt hour per metric ton to 61 kilowatt hour per metric ton moving on uh, the energy efficiency measures have been worked out for a standard 5000 metric tons cold storages cold storage having four chambers of capacity 1250 metric tons each the energy efficiency me measures falls under two main categories that is improving thermal performance of building envelope uh, and improving uh, overall refrigeration system performance so in in case of building envelope we have recommended insulation panels for walls and roof and air tight horizontal insulated doors with air curtains uh, will definitely improve the overall building performance uh, building envelope performance and for refrigeration plant we have uh, we have recommended variable frequency dry for compressors and for fans uh, uh, evaporative cond condenser instead of a atmospheric based condenser then we have also recommended plc controller for the refrigeration plant economizer for sub cooling suction line insulation and co2 scrubber overall the energy saving potential which exists with these measures is around 20 to 25% uh, moving on we have also estimated the avoided food loss Through the modernization of cold storages, as per our assessment, which was validated uh, through stakeholder consultation, the spoilage of up to five percent happening due to poor handling and inadequate storage conditions could be completely avoided in modern uh, cold storages. Additionally, the evaporative weight loss could also be reduced from five percent uh, to two to two point five percent in the modern ones. Uh, so, leading to a saving of around seven point five percent. Out of the total 10 percent potato losses happening in traditional cold storages uh, through modernization, which in monetary terms is around 70 million euros per year, so that's a huge number we are looking at if we if we can reduce the food uh, food loss, especially the potato loss in the existing cold storages. Moving on to the cost benefit analysis, the total saving potential through energy savings and avoided potato loss is around 78 million euros. With an investment uh, requirement of around 205 million euros, the simple payback period is 2.6 years, which can be further reduced to 1.6 years by factoring in the MIDS subsidy. Uh, so the reason of highlighting this point is we are also looking at government subsidy for recovering the investment uh, to make this investment more attractive to the to the investors and uh, make a you know a good case for the energy efficiency improvement and uh, food loss avoidance as well. Uh, moving on the slide presents various options to recover the investment option one is uh, energy saving through which we can recover our investment uh, which is well established proven uh, across the world and can be easily monitored option two is uh, monetizing the avoided food loss which represents bulk of the bulk of the savings as highlighted earlier um, for this proper mnv framework needs to be developed and needs to be uh, needs to be put in place before we before we go ahead, go ahead with this option then we can also look at uh, subsidies which are available and subsidies which can be transferred directly to the investor through a tie party eight agreement between government cold storage owners and esco uh, so that is also one of the option we can look at uh, the fourth option we are looking at is how we can utilize the better space uh, which is available due to the modernization around 20% additional space is available due to the modernization and this space can be further utilized for additional revenue Uh, by either having more commodities being managed as part of the existing cold storages and last but not the least we can also look at modern multi commodity cold storages in which multiple commodities are being managed uh, so that will also open up the new revenue streams i think sir all these things have been recommended all these options have been recommended as part of this study uh, in this slide i have tried to collate uh, all the uh, all the work we have done and i'll just summarize it uh, so in terms of field observation majority of cold storages in west bengal are designed with non standard non tested refrigeration systems uh, the traditional design and operation leads to food loss energy wastage uh, and safety hazards piecemeal upgradation of old cold storage facilities is prevalent uh, in terms of challenges restrictive policy and regulation by west bengal government is one of the challenge return on investment to energy savings alone is not viable high capital cost associated with setting up multi modern multi commodity and cold storage hubs is also a challenge in terms of solution and benefit which we also recommended as part of this study development of standardized energy efficiency measures package is important retrofitting of modernization into multi commodity cold storages is again uh, should be looked at 
and better net capacity utilization, lower operational expenditure, better storage quality, and higher price realization is also one of the solutions we have recommended. And in terms of recommendations, awareness programs on reducing post harvest potato losses, improvement in the policy environment, governing cold storages in West Bengal, holistic assessment of the entire value chain is a must rather than looking at it in isolation and thinking only about energy losses or thinking only about food losses in holistic is holistic assessment is important synchronization of government support both at center and state level for making a business case for retrofitting come modernization of cold storage is, is also important because we are also looking at subsidies available uh, at the state level and at the center level and credible monitoring and verification frameworks are required to track the food loss and the and the revenue generated through food loss and the revenue generated through energy loss. Uh, with this, I would like to thank you uh, and I'll be more than happy to take up any questions you may have. Uh, once again, thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you for this. Um, Tarun, yeah, this is a really impressive example of multiple benefits of energy efficiency or I, we always have almost have to say it's the other way around because the financial impact on the food losses that can be avoided is so much greater. So did you do this study with energy efficiency in mind or were you surprised at this Actually, impact? We, we started with, uh, with a focus on energy efficiency and we were, I think you're right, we were a bit surprised when we saw the food losses. Uh, I think the initial focus was on energy efficiency there, but then we decided to include food losses as part of uh, our analysis. And right now we are discussing it with the government of uh, of the state, this West Bengal, and looking at how it can be implemented in other cold storages as well, because that is one of the major problems in India where we are, you know, looking at food loss and waste. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a really great benefit. And are you presenting the results then also in for other audiences now for yes. agriculture and absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So great. Um, Thomas, do we have any questions in the chat? Uh, are reefers, refrigerated transport containers? also used as substitute or complement for stationary cold rooms in India for such applications? If so, what about the efficiency? So I, I, I believe we have not worked on the refrigerated transport, but in general, if you're talking about India, so refrigerated transport are mainly used for commodities which are uh, pre-cooled or which requires a temperature, uh, you know, uh, which is not uh, below the ambient temperature. So like for, uh, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm taking the example of grapes or apples, so the temperature requirement is minus one degree Celsius so, or zero degree Celsius. So I think there the refrigerated transport is required. And uh, I think uh, it's not, it, it could be a stationary one and it could be a mobile uh, one as well. But in terms of the efficiency, we have not done any specific work related to the efficiency. Uh, so I may not be able to comment on the energy efficiency right now. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tarun. And it's already time again to move on to the third presentation. Um, we are hearing Jillian Isuardi now. Uh, she is a lighting scientist at Light Naturally and has a PhD in optical physics. Over the last 15 years, she has conducted research into a range of topics in lighting, daylighting, and photography so please play the presentation. My name is Jillian Izawadi. This presentation is about the considerations required for the prediction of trends in luminous efficacy of LED products. It describes some of the processes that go into the development of solid state lighting performance guidelines, particularly for the IEA 4E SSL Annex. Luminous efficacy is a measure of the light output of an electrical lighting product per the energy consumed. The unit of measure is the lumen per watt. It's a good indicator of the energy efficiency of a lighting product, but I should note up front, it's not the only factor in lighting product quality. There are also lifetime color and other considerations. 
So here we see a graph from 2007 that shows the historical trend in efficacy of a range of lighting products. We see traditional technologies like incandescent there in orange or fluorescent in green, and the path they've taken in terms of efficacy over the years. The older technologies show an asymptotic trend in efficacy over time, which reflects a fundamental upper limit or technology barrier for each. In contrast, LED has a very steep predicted improvement in this graphic, which is now a little old and only predicts up to 2020. And at some point in the future, it too will reach its fundamental limit. But for now, while LED product efficacy is still increasing, and it is, uh, we need to find a way to predict the pace of that increase. We see here two different approaches to forecasting LED luminaire efficacy, both produced by the US Department of Energy. On the left, in their 2015 solid state lighting R&D plan, we see the results of an approach that looks at the component efficiencies within a luminaire and makes predictions on the technology improvements over the time period for each component and then the resulting overall luminaire efficacy. On the right, we see a graph of LED luminaire efficacy for different luminaire types. This graph shows trend lines produced by combining historical data across three LED product databases from 2009 to 2018 and then uses that historical data to make predictions about efficacy all the way up to 2035. So in these two examples uh, are predictions of average LED product efficacy, which is very useful for either forecasting technology trends, like on the left, or forecasting energy use, like the right-hand side uh, looking at energy savings forecasts for solid-state lighting. But there is also a need to be able to track not just the average, but also the top and bottom ends of the product market. At the bottom end, predicting the pace of improvements in the 20th to 30th percentile of products helps to clarify issues of minimum acceptable product performance or MEPS levels. And at the top end, knowledge of the trends in the 80th or 95th percentile of products allows us to understand the leading edge uh, of energy efficient products or HEPs levels. Examples of programs that might require this information include voluntary premium labelling, green procurement and incentive programs that promote the uptake of high quality LED products. And it's these HEPs and MEPS levels that give performance guidelines for products. And that's what we'll focus on in this work for the IEA 4E SSL Annex. And we're going to use a historical data approach. So with that in mind, we look at the focus of the presentation. Which data should we use? Good data are critical. That means good representation of current products available. And in order to be representative, it follows that you need large volume which is ideal, spread well across the categories to be considered, but also across the time period. Sufficient detail on a range of attributes of the product, which is what allows for like groups to be formed in each of the product categories. Uh, if you recall the previous LED luminaires chart we showed earlier, it shows significant differences in efficacy by luminaire category. And in 2020, this ranges from 50 lumens per watt for small downlights up to 30 lumens per watt for high and low bay luminaires. This range highlights the importance of having sufficiently detailed data for proper categorisation. Uh, it's preferred for data to be unrestricted in terms of efficacy. Threshold requirements tend to skew the efficacy of registered products compared to the general market, generally higher. And you'd prefer verified tested values and not just claimed values of product attributes for, for accuracy. Now, looking at the types of data we have available for analysis in this case, we have open product registers. Uh, the benefits are that they have no threshold or minimum performance requirements, uh, which is good, especially if you're trying to predict trends at the lower or MEPS end of the market. Uh, the drawback being that there's not always tested data on these types of registers. Energy efficient product registers, they'll generally have higher volumes, uh, at least within their relevant markets, and they often have tested data, particularly if that's required for scheme compliance. Uh, one of the drawbacks is that they'll have an efficacy minimum requirement, which may truncate data from the lower end of the market. And this requires mathematical adjustment or further knowledge if you need to use it for trend analysis. Then we have market data, which reflects what's available for purchase in a region. It can be quite large data uh, groups, but it's not always detailed. Uh, retail web data, for example, often lacks key information on products. Uh, and one of the other drawbacks is that the product is not always associated with the date that they enter the market. So there's often lag between products entering the market and still being available for purchase. And we've observed an estimated through data for that to be more than two years in some markets. And there's tested data, which again reflects what's available for purchase, uh, but is generally lower in volume and like market data can lag the latest innovation. So here is an example that illustrates the issue with data sources with and without thresholds. 
The chart included on this slide is also from the US DOE 2019 SSL forecast, and it shows the variation that can occur between these types of data sources. In orange, we see large downlight luminaire efficacy trends based on the US Lighting Facts database. In purple, the same products for Energy Star, and in blue, the Design Lights Consortium. In green, there's an average for the grouping of all products. So as some background on why these trends might differ, the DLC has very frequent updates of its minimum efficacy for registration. I would expect its products to increase in an average efficacy accordingly, as it has here. Energy Star does not update its minimum requirements as frequently and displays a flatter trend observed here. This example illustrates why we ultimately chose not to combine data sets between open and energy efficient registers. As if you select to do this, you require additional steps to purge multiple data listings across registers, and also the size of each group becomes a critical factor in the analysis. If they're unbalanced, which they generally are, then the results can be shifted by the idiosyncrasies of the dominant register. So all of these considerations lead us to select the open product register of the US Lighting Facts database for trend prediction, and that was based on the detail of the data available, uh, which allowed us uh, a lot of information about the range of attributes for each product. It was unrestricted, so there were no minimum requirements, uh, so it's less like, likely to be skewed for our MEPS trend analysis. Uh, there was good accuracy in the product age that was recorded for each product. However, not all products were tested, so there was a mix of both claimed and tested data on this database. Uh, there was high volume, and we ended up with over 17,000 products across a range of different product categories. We have seven product categories we were evaluating, uh, three lamp types and four luminaire types. But there were some drawbacks to using this database. So some of the groups don't have the most recent data, so lamp data doesn't continue beyond 2016 and luminaires beyond 2018 or 19. And some of the data, as I mentioned, is only claimed and not tested. So we were looking for ways to address those drawbacks. So to minimise these concerns, we used a large quantity of other types of data from a range of other sources and locations uh, to validate the trends that were determined using the US Lighting Facts data. Now, a range of sources across a broad range of countries is important for robust predictions that can be applied in international context, so that was very useful. But we also found that these other data sources were able to provide more recent data and it was largely tested and verified tested data as well. Uh, it also generally added to the volume of data. We had more than 75,000 products that we added to the initial considerations through this validation process. Here is a visual example of how the trend lines were developed. On the left-hand chart, we have in pink more than 5,000 US Lighting Facts data for linear lamps, grouped by year with trends extrapolated for the 20th, 80th and 95th percentiles over the years and forward to 2023, which is our year of interest in this case. On the right hand side, now I delete the US Lighting Facts data just for clarity, but I retain the trends and I add in a 95% confidence interval shaded in grey and then overlay those trends with additional data, in this case more than 30,000 data points from a range of sources. What we're looking for on the right hand chart is to ensure that in each year beyond the initial data, there are products achieving the levels as predicted. And that's shown here with products achieving at all performance levels in appropriate quantities. Looking at the validating data, we also see the data from sources with minimum requirements. So in dark blue, the DLC standard data already sits quite tightly with the MEPS predicted trend line. That's the red line at the bottom. While the unrestricted market data, we see the blue-green data points in the single year of 2017 with much more spread below that MEPS trend level, as well as adequate data above the highest HEPS level. Also interesting to note in this example, the gradient of the trend line in time for the MEPS performance level is lower than that for the HEPS level. Information that shows why separating out these levels for analysis is worthwhile. In each case, linear trends were determined to be mathematically the best fit, which is not necessarily realistic over much longer term projections, but not as significant in the short term range we're looking at here of about about five years. But in order to address this and ensure the most realistic projections, we determined 2023 values using a predicted efficacy range approach. We determined a range of efficacy using the linear trend as the upper range limit and the lower end of the 95% confidence interval is the lower range limit. And you can see here shaded in blue, 
the three efficacy ranges that are produced at the different performance levels, the 20th, 80th and 95th percentile. Then from within that range, an appropriate 2023 value for efficacy can be determined using the overlaid validating data to ensure consistent and realistic outcomes. And you see here the overlaid data for directional lamps. So this is what the trend and data validation charts look like across all of those seven LED product categories. I won't go over the detailed results of all of this trend analysis. The intent of this talk was to look deeper into the processes of data selection and those considerations. But these results have been incorporated into the efficacy requirements of the latest public draft of the IEA's 4E SSL Annex's Quality and Performance Requirements document. So if you're keen to see those numbers, please follow the link above to view a copy of the public draft. Instead, to conclude, I'd like to finish with a case study showing the application of HEPs targets. This case study is based on data from a white certificate program in the Australian state of Victoria, the Victorian Energy Upgrades Program, or VEU. This program promotes LED lighting upgrades in residential and commercial settings. Data from products registered for this program allow us to compare their product efficacy versus the general market. This chart is for non-directional LED lamps, also known as GLS replacement lamps, and I've got an example of one of those pictured on the right there. It shows efficacy on the vertical axis, and each box plot represents the range of efficacies in a group of lamp data. The bottom of each coloured box shows the 20th percentile efficacy for the group, the top of the box shows the 80th percentile, and the midline shows the average efficacy for each group. In green are the Victorian Energy Upgrades program registered products. The first green box on the left is data collected between 2008 and 2017. The second green box on the far right shows the program registered lamps following performance target review in 2018. The difference between the two green groups is obvious. There is little overlap in the boxes, so the most efficient products on the register prior to 2017 are below the least efficient in 2018. In blue, we have market data from a 2018 survey of more than 2,000 lamps of this type for sale in Australia. Comparing this blue market data with the program data in green, we see that the review of program performance targets in 2018 lifts the efficacy profile of program registered products from at or below general market to well above. In orange for comparison, uh, we see contemporary non-directional LED lamp data from a range of international energy efficient product registers. First, we have Japan's energy saving product database in 2017 then Thailand's Electricity Saving Label Number 5 product database in 2019, and India's Star Label product database in 2019. These data show us that it is the HEPs type targets that can be effective at encouraging the application of the most energy efficient products. In this case, we see average efficacies 15 to 30% higher than the broader market population. Now I need to add here that this talk only shows one facet of LED product performance, and that's efficacy. Driving energy efficiency is important, but this should not be at the cost of quality, performance, safety and lifetime, other dimensions of LED product performance. This BEE program includes other product performance requirements accordingly, as should any similar program. Uh, and as we see here, it's critical that these performance requirements are designed with good quality and periodically updated data. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thanks for this presentation. Um, so I, it, I, it makes us, I think, from Europe um, uh, humble because uh, we're only having a product database very recently and so many other <laughs> world I'm regions. I'm very much looking forward to that database, actually. Yes, it's... yes. So you think this uh, definitely will be useful to do such analysis? Yes, look, I think it will be. Um, ultimately, like I said, any, any products collected on a database that already have a, a MEPS level, it becomes hard to track the MEPS trend. But that's you, you can still certainly use that data to track average trends and HEPS trends as well and, and other dimensions of, of product quality, not just efficacy. Yeah. Um, and did you gain any insights in uh, how much is maybe the LED and how much is 
like optical materials and lenses in the luminaire um, of look yeah sure that's um that's one of the reasons why the different products can't all be lumped together is because they have uh, by their nature different uh, uh, engineering in in the product um, and so there'll be some products that do have a lot of optical losses through things like lenses and and other systems and there's some that are quite small and in small packages you can't manage to fit in as much sort of uh, electronics to, to, to do different things. So, you know, there are, there are variations by type um, and certainly the, the optical losses and those other sorts of losses are fairly well known. Really what this was more about was looking at these groups as a whole and with a historical data approach, making some predictions about how over the next few years they're going to track. Yes, so um, listeners, are you posting your questions? Um, Someone asked how the data from so many databases has been gained for the validation process. It's all data that is, is generally freely available if, available if we're talking about the registered data. So all of those energy efficient product registers, you can go to those websites and download the data that's available. Um, similarly, like US Lighting Facts data was a download for, from the public. Then uh, for the market survey, that wasn't actually a web call survey, that was a, a manual surveillance. Um, and it was a, a fairly large one. That's not open, like that, that's something that, that we had access to. Um, and the test data is another thing that's it, it's harder to come by. It, it's data that that's obviously ha comes from sort of uh, measurement and verification uh, processes, but not formal ones. So uh, it, it's part of the work that the Annex does uh, is to keep uh, a, an eye on those sorts of issues in, in the broader market. So to answer the question, the registered data was by download. The market data was not by web call, although that's an option. One of the issues I think I mentioned with that option is uh, if you're looking at, say, websites that sell lamps, you don't always get a sufficient amount of data to group uh, products together nicely so that you can get really cohesive groups, which was a real priority um, because I think as you saw from the graph I was trying to show you, I actually had a, a, a misspoke. It was from 50 lumens per watt to 130 lumens per watt was the range in one year of the average efficacies between the least e uh, efficacious product and the most efficacious product. So there's quite a lot of variation if you don't group those products well. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, then I think we will end this session. Uh, and please, all the speakers, can you just uh, show your face again and say goodbye? And thank you so much, everybody, for discussing and listening and posing questions and answering questions. And have a good day. Bye. Many thanks. Bye. Bye bye.